All right, all right. How are we feeling? Good? Good, good, good. Uh, hello to those of you who are joining from a campus. I uh, am Luke, and I'm excited to be here at Lifeline. I love being at Lifeline, uh, and I love the energy that you all bring to here and also your campuses. It just makes the whole night super fun. So uh, we are in a series that is called uh, Big Words, and over the last few weeks, we've been looking at words that uh, maybe you read in your Bible, you uh, hear at church, but you uh, are a little hesitant or unclear about what they actually mean. And I think, and I hope that you've seen if you've been uh, here the last couple of weeks, that understanding what a word means and uh, kind of focusing in on what that word is, not only is good for our brains, like, okay, clarity, next time I hear that in church, I'll know, but it is also good just for our, our journey uh, closer to Jesus. To understand what words are that come from this book, the Bible, it actually, uh, the more we understand, the more we are uh, able to draw closer, the more we're able to uh, understand God's, uh, God's desire for our lives. So, uh, before we get into tonight's conversation, I want to pray for us here and at the campuses. So uh, take a breath and let's pray together. God, we, we thank you for your word. I thank you that uh, you have brought every person um, to this place, to their campus for a specific purpose. And I just pray that tonight, uh, the, the friendship, the fun, the laughter, the uh, opening up of your word uh, you would um, do whatever it is you need to do, not only for uh, all of us in Lifeline, but for each of us individually, that your, your spirit would move in us as we open up your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So uh, tonight's word is a word that we uh, throw around a lot. It was actually, uh, I mentioned it a few times in the teaching last week, but it's a word that is said so much in church, and I think we will we'll maybe even say it, but we don't know uh, fully what it means. And that word that I want to talk about tonight is sin. I said this in Lifeline. Like, uh, last week we talked about eternity. I said eternity is enjoying uh, the, the new world that God created, the full presence of God, without the effects of sin. And sin is one of those words that it's like, okay, I think I get what sin is. It's like bad things or doing wrong or, or something like that. But tonight what I want to do is I want to define it, but I also want to talk about it. Because maybe you have a, a real problem figuring out what to do with your sin. And I want to talk about that in a little bit. But first, just to define it, maybe you'd say sin is like, doing bad things or hurting other people or uh, doing things that, uh, you know, God doesn't want us to do. And all those would be uh, accurate. But the, the definition I want to show you tonight, and I hope uh, to make this clear, uh, sin is missing the mark. Sin is missing the mark. See, uh, God, the one who created us, the one who created us with intentionality, with purpose, created us to know him and follow him, he uh, is the one who sets the standard for what is good and what is true. As a creator of the universe, he's the one that decides uh, what is right and what is wrong. And sin is the things that we do uh, or the things that we neglect doing that uh, miss God's intent for us, miss the mark. And uh, we see uh, patterns of sin from the beginning of our Bible all the way through uh, throughout our Bible. We see uh, people struggling to do the things God has called them to do. People outright going against God's word and God's plan for them. And we notice it, uh, if, you, if you were to read from the front page all the way through the New Testament, the people in this book have a problem with sin. The people in this book have a problem doing the things that God has called them to do and staying away from the things that God said are outside of his plan for his people. And it's not only if you look at this book, but if you look at this world, we have a problem with sin. 
There are so many things happening in this world from uh, violence to hatred to war to all of these different things that are just an impact of humanity uh, choosing something else other than God, of humanity missing the mark to uh, what God had in store for us. And it's not only if you look at this book, it's not only if you look at the world, you see the impact of sin, the, the hatred, the, the people, the, the anti-God like uh, mindset in this world, but it's also if, you, if you're honest, if you look in the mirror. I mean, I am a, a, a pastor, I work at a church, and I am deeply passionate about uh, who Jesus is and what he's done for me and uh, what he desires to do in your life. And I have sinned in my life. I, uh, despite desiring to do what, what, what God wants me to do, what I'm created to do, I often miss the mark. Uh, uh, the Apostle Paul, one of the, one of the early like, missionaries, church-starting uh, people in the Bible, he wrote, uh, more, he wrote like, uh, most of the New Testament. He said this about sin. And I think this is good for us to begin this conversation getting on the same page. This is what he says, Romans 3.23. He says this, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Right here, Paul is saying, listen, God had a mark. He, he was like, this is uh, my plans for my people. This is what I desire uh, these people to do. This, if you're interested in, in living a life of flourishing, of making the world a better place, of being the person I've called you to be, this is the mark. And Paul is saying here, we have all missed the mark. And we all continue to miss the mark. I mean, Paul himself, like, it's a pretty big deal if you can say, yeah, you know the Bible that's like still famous thousands of years later that, that uh, God's spirit moves in and, and communicates to people and inspires people. Like Paul could be like, I wrote like uh, a lot of that actually, you know, I'm Paul. And, and throughout the Bible, even later in Romans, in this letter he wrote to the church in Rome, he says that he has a problem with sin. I mean, he says, the thing I want to do, I can't do. Like, I, I just, there's, there's like this tension within me to do the thing I want to do, but I don't. And the thing I want to avoid, I end up doing. Like, he's saying, I have a problem with sin. Sin is missing the mark. And, and friends, we miss the mark. And so maybe you're in a space where you're like, okay, I have the things that I struggle with. I have the things that, uh, that like I do that hurt others or I know are outside of God's desire for me. I, I break the rules or I, I, I lie or I do any, any list of things. And you're wondering like, what do I do with my sin? What do I do with my sin? As a, as someone who sins and as someone who, uh, has, Consider this question, what do I do with my sin? I just want to tell you a few things that maybe you are already doing, uh, ways you've tried to combat your sin, and then show you a way that I think is, has been most effective in my journey, in my faith journey, and what I see in scriptures in dealing with our sinful behaviors, the, the behaviors that we have that miss the mark of God's plan for us. The first thing that uh, I tried to do in my life was... Uh, like succumb, I, I succumb to my desires. And I know succumb is a weird word, but succumb is like, I, uh, I have this feeling of the thing that I want to do, and I know it's not, I know it's not in God's plan for us, but I'm just going to go ahead and do it anyways. Most people don't start here. But, but over time, we can grow comfortable in our sin, in our reckless behaviors. And maybe this is, your story, you have succumbed to the patterns of sin in your life. Like maybe uh, you started uh, making up stories about other people or, or sharing stories that weren't yours to share at school. And it started uh, like a little thing, like uh, you, you, you had some information about someone it wasn't necessarily even that bad and you shared it and then you felt the acceptance from sharing that thing. You now had information that was valuable for other to know, others to know. 
And when you said it, you had that moment where it's like, I, I felt kind of bad that I said it. But then you also have the moment of approval and acceptance from your friends. And then you do it again, and you share a little again, and you feel bad again. And, and, and then you share another story, and you feel bad again. And then uh, the next time they're gathered, you share another thing that is kind of half true about someone. And, and over time, you, you're, you're, you're succumbing to your pattern of sin. You've stopped caring, and you've stopped feeling bad. I know I've been there where you do the thing enough, and then you no longer feel bad about it. You no longer have conviction from God about the thing that you do. And God's word is clear that the, the, the path of the wicked, the, the evil, it, it leads to our destruction. It leads to succumbing to our, our sinful desires or the reckless behaviors. It, le- it doesn't lead to our flourishing. It doesn't, I mean, it, it hurts other people tremendously, more than we could imagine. So that was one thing that I feel like I've, I've, I did in my life. And the other one is kind of maybe more church appropriate or church, uh, it's not as obvious. And that's just suppress, suppressing sin. And what I mean here is you can try to pretend and act like you are walking as a perfect human being. And any of those uh, sinful desires that you have, you just try to stuff them down as much as possible. And you say, you know what? I'm going to act like they're not even there. I'm going to pretend like I'm doing fine. I'm going to act like I don't struggle. I'm going to, I, I, in, the, in the church building, I'm going to pretend like I never make any mistakes. And it is so, so easy to fall into this. Where suppression of sin or suppression of these desires that we have ultimately lead us to acting out or to resenting God because we try to pretend like our sin isn't there instead of dealing honestly with it. Now, friends, I want to tell you tonight a a different way. And it's a way uh, that the author of Hebrews describes. And as the author of Hebrews, it's a book in the New Testament written to uh, early Jesus followers. He describes a way to deal with our sin that I think is so valuable that uh, whatever it is you're going through, this isn't like going to eliminate any desire to sin. It's not, but, but I think it is the single most thing, just speaking from my heart, it is the single most thing that has helped me in my journey of following Jesus as it relates to sin. So if you have a, a Bible here at our campuses, I want to go to Hebrews It's in the New Testament. It's near the back of your Bible. And it's in chapter 3, and it'll be on the screen as well, but chapter 3, verses uh, 12 and 13. Uh, Actually, just verse 12. We'll focus there tonight. Listen to this. This is the author of Hebrews talking to Jesus' followers. Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters, make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. The author says, be careful that uh, your hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you uh, against the living God. And I'll keep going, actually. It says, you must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. The interesting thing, and and Jesus mentions this too in his preaching, is that when talking about sin, the author of Hebrews talks about an evil and unbelieving heart that can lead us to sin, right? He says, make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, which will turn you away from the living God. Here's what I want to communicate to you tonight. The sin that you're dealing with the, the, the problems that you have of missing the mark, and it's like, I don't want to do that thing. I, I don't want to do the thing that hurts God and hurts others, but I find myself doing it. Is it possible that taking care of your heart and focusing your attention on Jesus, the one who is life and the one who is good, would actually be a better solution to you figuring out the sin in your life, or maybe uh, lessening those sinful desires in your heart than focusing or obsessing about the actual sin? Is it possible that your heart, when it is just kind of going through life mindlessly, going from one thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing, uh, ends up leading you to actions that are against God? 
that your unbelieving heart, like living like God isn't real or, or doesn't care or isn't a big deal, that that is the thing that actually leads you to those actions that you regret. He says, be careful that your heart is not sinful and unbelieving, which can turn you away from God. And so the question is just, where is your heart at? Are you seeking Jesus? See, that is a solution, I think, to sin. And it's not the ultimate solution, although he is, and I'll get to that as we close, but it's not the ultimate solution, but it is the solution to a journeying in this life as a broken person. Not to succumb to my desires or my temptations. Not to uh, suppress all of my feelings and act as if they're not even there. But to seek Jesus, the one who is beautiful and lovely and the one who is worth pursuing. It is when my heart is believing that I follow him closely. It is when my heart sees him for who he is that I do the things that he has called me to do. Jesus is the solution to sin. Jesus, the one who lived and died on the cross for you and the one who rose from the dead, he is the solution to our problem. So practically speaking, the best thing we can do is focus our attention on him. The writer of Hebrews actually highlights this later in the book. See, in chapter 12, this is probably one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. In chapter 12, uh, the writer of Hebrews says this, "Therefore, uh, uh, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. He just finished talking about all of these heroes in faith who were not perfect, but who followed God closely. He said, therefore, since we're surrounded by a huge cl- uh, crowd of witnesses to life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. So he's saying, let us get rid of that sin. Let us run with endurance the race that God has set for us. Let us live the life that God has for us. And the question is, how? How as a sixth, seventh, eighth grader do I live the life God has for me? How as a sixth, seventh, eighth grader do I run the race? Do I strip off all the things that entangle me, the sin that hurts me? He tells us, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. We do this, we live this life that God has for us. And we walk as broken people in a broken world by fixing our eyes on Jesus. He is the solution. He is. And my friends, it's not just that we give our attention to Jesus. It's that he actually eliminated sin once and for all on the cross. Maybe you know this. Maybe you've heard it a hundred times. Maybe you don't. But I just want you to, to, I want to end this conversation tonight by resting in the reality that it's not just that Jesus, focusing our attention on Jesus, the one who died and rose again and is still alive, can help us with some of our destructive habits. It's that on the cross, he eliminated sin once and for all. I want to close with this verse from 2 Corinthians. And I want you to hear it. Hear the good news in it. This is what it says. 2 Corinthians 5.21. This is Paul again. He said, God made Christ who never sinned. Jesus was perfect. He always hit the mark that God has for, had for his people. To be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. God made Christ, who is perfect, and Christ willingly stepped forward and said, I'm going to pay for the sins of everyone who believes in me. That the, Any of the, the wrong that we've ever done was eliminated on the cross with Christ dying for you. That anyone who believes in Jesus would have life eternal with God, that when God sees you because of what Jesus did, he sees the beauty and the perfection of Jesus. And so I, I, I offered this invitation last week and I'll offer it again tonight. Jesus is the solution to your sin. And, and maybe you've never made a decision 
to let him be the solution to your sin. Maybe you've never said, God, I want what Jesus did on the cross to count for me. I want the, the, the perfect life of Jesus to count for me. I want the perfect sacrifice of Jesus dying in my place for all my sin, for all my wrong to count for me. And if that's you, I, as, I, as I close, I just want to lead you in a prayer. A prayer that is a moment between you and God to pray to Jesus about where you're at and about your sin. So I'm going to pray and then the people at the campuses and, and uh, Amanda here, they're going to lead us in a practice. So let's pray. If you've never asked God to allow Jesus' perfection to count for you, just repeat these words in your heart. This is between you and God. God, I know that I have a problem with sin. I know that I do things that hurt others. I know that I've done wrong. God, thank you for offering forgiveness through Jesus. Thank you for sending Jesus to pay the price for my sins. I accept his new life. I accept his death on my behalf. And I desire to follow you the rest of my life. And God, if, if there are people who've prayed that prayer, I just pray that you would Lead them to someone tonight to talk about their sin, about uh, their new life found in you. And as we walk through this practice, reflecting on what's going on in our lives, I just pray that you would continue to lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name, amen.